Hello everyone and welcome to today's ANS webinar on linking data and publications, the Scolix initiative. So let's get started. Uh, my name's Natasha Simons and I'm from the Australian National Data Service or ANS and I'm your host for today. So I'd like to introduce our speaker for today, Dr. Adrian Burton. Adrian is the Director of Services for ANS and he's based in Canberra. So I'll now hand over to Adrian. Thanks Natasha. So today we're talking about uh, the Scolix Initiative, as uh, Natasha indicated. This is about linking data and literature. And uh, by literature we mean this, you know, scholarly, the published scholarly communications, could be journal articles, books, reports, and by data we really quite broadly thinking about uh, data, data sets, data services, models, software, etc. So today actually is a story. It's a story of a lonely data access portal way off in the southern hemisphere in Australia. A very important data set that's held there. It's data set D that we can see. It's a very um, important uh, research asset and uh, the data access portal is pretty pleased that they've been able to uh, make it available uh, as, a, as an asset for further research. As it happens, a half a world away, in the Journal of Studies on the other side of the planet, someone has uh, published an article, that's uh, Article A, and it actually has a reference to, it mentions the, uh, the famous data set D from the data access portal, which is really good news because uh, that's why they started the data access portal uh, to have uh, build new research on, uh, on the old research, to return investment on the investment in data and to spark innovation and new research. So this is really good news that uh, a journal article has been written based on the data access portal. The problem is it's a very long way away and in fact the people over at the data access portal have no idea that this journal article has been written. So all their good work has come to fruition but they, there's no way for them to know about where and which articles uh, may have uh, referenced the data. So the uh, manager of, the, uh, of this uh, data center says we really do need to know, you know what's happening with our data. We really need to know when it's being used in research. So sets a couple of information professionals uh, afoot and says okay we need to sort this, I want you to search the internet, I want you to get access to all these journals, I want you to get the full text, we need to mine through all these uh, journals and we'll put this, the, the title of our uh, data set, data set D there, we know people are using it, we need to find it somewhere in the, in the scholarly communications. And then we, you can build tools and so you know for a number of years they've got you know, three information professionals scouring the internet, uh, building tools building up a view of what it means. Now there are lots of journals, that's the proviso here, uh, at least ten tens of thousands of journals. Uh, to get an idea of how many journal articles there are, Crossref has uh, over 75 million DOIs, so that's at least 75 million uh, different published journal articles and then there's a lot more scholarly literature than that. So it's quite a big job and over five years really they've put in a lot of work, they've got some full text access to the particular journals where they know their particular scientists have been publishing, but not terribly satisfactory result because it's still not really very comprehensive and they can't be sure and it's really a bit of a coat hanger and string job rather than anything terribly robust. The other problem is that there are lots and lots of data centers as well and they're also putting in exactly the same effort all over the place scouring, searching, trying to get access, trying to build tools. So this part of our, this chapter of the story comes to a close here in a little bit of an unsatisfactory sort of tone, really looking for needles in haystacks all over the world. In a parallel chapter, there's another story, a different journal here, uh, off in some remote part of the world. They have uh, published another article, Article A here, which is good, that's what journals should do. But people have said to them, well, wait a minute, this is really good research, we'd love to be able to get our hands on the data that underlies, that underpins the findings. We'd like to look at the models, we'd like to see what software, we'd like to see the data. 
but there's no mention in it, of it in your journal. So they think, right, we need to do something about this. We need to start contacting data centres. As it turns out, there is a data centre in Australia where a data set has been deposited and they even mentioned the fact that this data set underpinned the, the uh, research that was published in that journal uh, and that journal article uh, A. So that's the, the cruel and bitter irony of this is that actually the data had been deposited somewhere but the journal doesn't know about it. So the journal starts to think, right, we need to start uh, establishing these uh, bilateral relationships with a number of important data centres so that we can find out whether the journal articles that we have have been mentioned in the, the descriptions of any data sets anywhere in the world. Again, this is even more sort of uh, cottage industry because each data centre has a slightly different interface, expresses the information about a link between a data set and literature in a slightly different way. So this really is a hard slog and there's lots of data centres, centres obviously, and so that means there's a lot of these individual bilateral arrangements that need to be made to try and find again this needle in the haystack of which data centre might have data that underpins our journal. And as we saw, there are lots of journals uh, uh, and uh, lots of other publications around the place and they're all trying to do again all these, um, either not doing it because it's just too hard or if they do then they're replicating all these one -on uh, bilateral arrangements separately again. So the second chapter of our story comes again to a rather sort of unsatisfactory end where we got a little bit of a view of the links between data and literature but not really uh, a very upbeat ending. Enter stage left uh, scholics. It's trying to move into that centre area, uh, a whole set of uh, players in the scholarly communications world trying to see whether we could do this a little bit better. It's uh, a working group sponsored by the Research Data Alliance and the World Data System. It has a number of uh, publishers, uh, peak publishing bodies, data centres, uh, service providers, infrastructure providers. have all come together in this working group to say, look, we really should be able to do something a little bit better here. The first steps that happen is to say, now what, let's you all have at least a, a common idea of what's happening here and some common language. Really what we're talking about is quite simple. There are two objects in the scholarly literature. Uh, one's a data set and one is um, a piece of literature. They are linked and there is a relationship between the two. And we get that information from some of the players in the scholarly system. So the working group starts to build up you know, at least a set of common language so that we can start to attack this problem in a, in, a, in a shared way. Now going back to that very messy exchange of information, as it turns out some of the members of this working group are natural hubs for this kind of information. Uh, so Crossref collects all sorts of references from journals all over the world. Thousands of journals uh, actually are, are providing information into Crossref about the references from journals. So there's already a, a kind of a natural community hub there in Crossref. Uh, Datasite was another of the members of the working group and they were already uh, receiving information about data sets and uh, one of the pieces of information that you can provide to Datasite is a related identifier, which means a related you know, piece of literature in lots of cases. So data site we already have uh, this relationship with hundreds and hundreds of uh, data centres around the world and they're collecting that information. Open Air was another example of a, a global aggregator of information from institutional repositories and these institutional repositories do contain data and literature and uh, sometimes they know about the link between uh, those data sets and uh, literature or vice versa. So we already had some natural uh, community hubs uh, that could at least tidy up a bit of the, all of that uh, cross uh, information. So the idea was if uh, some of these uh, natural hubs could then simply 
exchange information between them, then that would simplify uh, all these one-on-one -on -one relationships that we saw earlier in the story. So that was what was uh, proposed, at least as a start-off. Now, of course, these are not the only communities in the world, and the, the Scolix uh, initiative is open to uh, new hubs and uh, new communities who can uh, bring their information in. But the idea was that it's not that all the thousands of data centers and all the different journals in the world, they don't all need to be exchanging information when there are some hubs. If the hubs can just exchange the information, then that makes life easier for everyone. So uh, they did agree, the, the community, and the, there's a Scolix link information package that they agreed on. And so there's now a way for the, uh, these big community hubs to exchange information. I won't go into all the details of this. If you would like to become a hub, then join the working group and you can get all this information. But basically, it's the very minimal information about the two objects, the source object and the target. One, for example, being a, uh, a journal and the other being a, a data set. And you give some uh, the basic information about uh, the two objects and then a little bit of information about the link itself. So that was part of the, um, the workings of this uh, working group to agree on a, uh, an, an interchange format. And that can be interchanged in lots of different ways. Currently, they agree to uh, exchange that through some very simple open APIs using JSON. So once that, that, that information can flow between the, the hubs, uh, we were able to establish an aggregation of that information. Uh, it's called the DLI service, which stands for the Data Literature Interlinking Service. The, our colleagues at OpenAir um, kindly did all the development for this. Uh, it's the first of an aggregation. All this information is uh, open information, so we're encouraging lots of people to um, aggregate potentially for a domain or for a community, uh, but this DLI service is uh, the the first sort of global aggregation of this information, and it's uh, there really to, sh to push forward with a number of testbed uh, implementations. So the DLI service uh, aggregates the information from those hubs, and so now we have a much tidier kind of architecture. So what does that mean now for those two very sort of unsatisfactory stories that we started with? One of those stories, do you remember, was that there was a, a data center that knew about the link between a data set and a journal article that had been published by this journal, but the journal didn't know about it. So what would that mean in, in this new uh, world? Here's an example, a real world example of this. Scopus, this is a page from Scopus. Scopus is not a journal, but it, it uh, is an abstract and indexing uh, database that pulls information about uh, journal publications. So here they pulled some information about a particular journal publication that had, had been published. Uh, previously, they, you know, as nobody had any idea about, you know, what data uh, was uh, linked to this publication, and the journal certainly didn't know that, so there's no way that Sco Scopus would have known that. Uh, so I've just added in a new entity here, an abstract and an indexing database who've abstracted this, who've indexed the information about that journal article, but they still had no idea uh, of whether there was any link to the underlying data. So now what's possible is for them to fire off a query to that, to that service and find out, actually, there is a link to a data set somewhere, and uh, now we can provide that link. So now what happens when you are in Scopus, uh, as they load this page up, they, they fire off that little query to the DLI service. It's based on the persistent identifier of the journal article, uh, the DOI. So just fire it in and say, uh, do you know, uh, are there any data sets that are, uh, are related to this journal article? And as we saw, the, rep the response came back and it said yes. There is. So now there's a little information panel in uh, Scopus that uh, has the uh, title of this data set, and you can click on it and go back to the University of Adelaide. So that's a, a, a much sort of happier ending to that little story, and as you can see, it's a, a new little panel that's uh, on uh, every appropriate page uh, within Scopus. Do you remember the second story? And that was where the journal 
published an article. There was a reference to some data, but the original data centre actually didn't know about that. So how would that look in, under this new arrangement? So I'll give the example here uh, of a data centre. It's uh, GenBank. They're very done a big arrow there because they're very modest about uh, how they market themselves here. So this is a GenBank page for a gene sequence. That's as much as I know about this. Being a linguist, I, it all looks like gobbledygook to me, but it's something about mice. So there's a gene sequence here for uh, uh, something about uh, mice. Now, the important thing to note here, even if we don't understand what it's all about, is that there is a, a persistent identifier for this uh, data, the, the, this uh, sequence, it's the uh, reference sequence number, uh, NM010186.5. So uh, in, under our new arrangements, the data center that I've got portrayed over here, they've got this data about this uh, gene sequence, but they're not 100% sure which published literature has uh, a reference to it. So they can now send that uh, persistent identifier across and the reply comes back saying, yes, actually we do have uh, a journal article that has uh, referenced that sequence. So there it is, it's in the uh, Journal of Veterinary Immuno Immunology and Immunopathology. And there are two references to that uh, sequence in there. So that, again, is a, a much happier ending. So if we think that is a happy ending, then uh, people, we, you know, we're now encouraging people to, so I should pause here and say that, you know, this is, a, these have been uh, Pathfinder projects and test beds and uh, part of the working group. We think there's a pretty good model there that can work. Uh, and the first step is to get uh, a bit more coverage uh, into the um, Scolix information ecosystem. So how do we get uh, information in there? The good news is, do you remember we said that the individual data centers, the thousands of them and the thousands of journals, etc. no one needs to change what they're doing there. If you have, for example, uh, a relationship with DataSite, then you just simply need to add this uh, little piece of uh, information to the DataSite metadata. It's a related identifier, there's the, the DOI, and um, that will be included into the uh, Scolix ecosystem. The information on that is in the uh, data site schema and the link is down the bottom there. If you're a journal, uh, again, you don't need to do anything different from what you're doing now. You're already giving information to uh, Crossref in all likelihood, and there are a couple of different ways in which journals can give references to uh, Crossref. The bottom one is a standard sort of citation uh, format. The top one is a new thing called related item, which uh, allows you to give a, a slightly more, uh, a richer view of uh, what the related item is. And as you can see, it's got the uh, identifiers and a uh, little description. And, but this is all standard. The thing to note here, this is all standard Crossref uh, exchange metadata. There's no new language. There's no new... There's no new information pathway either, that you just use the, the existing pathway that you have to Crossref. Again, there's more information on this from Crossref. How, to, how do you deposit your data citations is a very helpful uh, blog on that, and the link is at the bottom of that slide. I won't go over, the same thing applies for open air and the institutional repositories. What I will just mention is if you're in Australia, there is a, uh, a shortcut method that we have, uh, because ANS has been part of this working group, uh, the ANS Research Data Australia service is uh, a mini Scolix hub, and all the uh, data set collection uh, descriptions that ANS has in Research Data Australia pumped into the Scolix information uh, world if they have a related publication. So here's another way for a very easy way for Australian repository and data centre managers to do this. Uh, just include here a related information um, type of publication using the standard RIF-CS exchange that we use with all the data centres in Australia and you can include um, the identifier, a title, some notes, etc. And so you can get some pretty nice information in there absolutely free of charge by uh, the exact same route that you use for uh, populating research data Australia.
the uh, uh, URL for the information about related info and how to add that to your feed is down the bottom of this slide. And uh, just to sort of go back, do you remember the journal article that appeared, uh, so this the data set that appeared in Scopus? It was this particular one from the University of Adelaide, the molecular simulations of proteins and peptide adsorption. So that was the exact uh, thing that is currently uh, being displayed in, uh, in the Scopus page for the publication and the information has come from this uh, research data Australia page here you see at the bottom there's a related publication so ANS is a little system that we just take that information and uh, push it into Scolex. So I don't know whether there's anyone from the University of Adelaide watching today but I'm hoping that they're pleasantly surprised that this information has just been syndicated in there. And that goes for all the providers to uh, research data Australia in, in Australia. All right, so if you're not included in any of those parts, so potentially you don't have a relationship with Crossroads or DataSite or ANS or OpenAir or et cetera, then there's always the option of becoming a hub yourself. Uh, and that we encourage you to join the uh, working group and collect information from your, so if you're a specialist astronomy data center, for example, uh, you may not have a, a relationship with data site, you've got your own identifiers, uh, you can just join the working group and start to expose that information, it will be aggregated and be part of this new ecosystem. So that's another option. Now, how to get information back from the Scolix e ecosystem, that's uh, another interesting question. Really, uh, this is uh, being developed as we speak now, so probably better that you join the working group if you want to do this, but I'll quickly go over that just so that you've got the broader idea. Uh, there is the DLI website, you can go and type stuff in. Uh, it also has uh, a set of APIs that are being developed. This particular Swagger site will give you the uh, information about the different methods that you can use. The ones that we I showed here and uh, that Scopus and other people are using are this links from PID. So you provide a PID and it will return you with all the research objects that are related to that uh, PID. But please join the working group if you're thinking of uh, using that information because it's, um, it's been uh, optimized as we speak and your use case can help to design what those APIs and the queries can be. There's some stuff upcoming from both Crossref and DataSite. They're exposing their event data using this uh, Scolix model and so those will be more community focused uh, queries where they'll only cover the, the, the DOI uh, side of things. So that's uh, where things are. I think that's a, a little bit of a happier ending to the story of uh, linking uh, literature and data. I should make it clear at the moment that you know these are Pathfinder, it's not comprehensive, the aggregation of information is not comprehensive yet. It's not fully established, but we are levering some very established uh, global infrastructure in data sites, Crossref, uh, OpenAir, and a number of uh, operational data centers and, and journals around the world. So I think there is a really good model there that uh, can be made comprehensive and can be come and established uh, part of the scholarly communication system. If you'd like any further information, then um, there's the Scholix website and ANS also has uh, some information about uh, working with Scholix. So I will pause there and hand back to Natasha. Thanks very much, Adrian. That was really great.